an instrumental action is just an action which happens in order to bring about an outcome. So for example, if you push a button in order to retrieve a snack, or if you board a bus in order to get home, then you're performing an instrumental action. Here's another example. Uh, Aisha there is holding out Zach's glass, uh, this Aisha there, and that's me, and I'm pouring some sparkling wine. Um, and what happens, it's very unfortunate, the sparkling wine misses the glass and it goes all over Zach's trousers and it soaks Zach's trousers. I might say, gosh, Zach, I'm super sorry. The goal of my action was not to soak your trousers, but to fill your glass. The goal of my action was not to soak your trousers, but to fill your glass. As that illustrates, among all of the various things that we might do, opening, pouring, and tilting, in this case with the bottle, there are actual and possible outcomes. And among all of the actual and possible outcomes of this action, there are some, such as filling Zach's glass, which explain why the action occurred in this sense. My action, the pouring, happened in order to bring about that outcome, the filling, and not any other outcome. So this is instrumental action, an action that happens to bring about an outcome. That's not to say, of course, that the action will always actually bring about the outcome, as in this case, just that it is in some sense supposed to. So now we can ask a fundamental question about instrumental action. What's the relation between an instrumental action and the outcome or the outcomes to which it's directed. In this case, what is it that relates the actions I perform, the open pouring, tilting and the rest, to the filling as opposed to doing any other thing like soaking Zach's trousers? What makes it the case that my action is, as we might say, directed to that outcome and not any other? Well, here's a very standard idea. Standard idea is that it's intention that provides for that relation. Why is that? Well, the attention is doing two things. It is specifying a particular outcome, the filling of the glass. So the intention represents or directs us to that action. And furthermore, the action provides for, sorry, the intention provides for the coordination of my actions. And it does so in such a way that ordinarily, thanks to that coordination, it's more likely that Zach's glass will be filled than it would be if the intention were absent provides for the coordination of the actions. So in this way, you can see that the intention underpins the instrumentality of the action. It provides for the relation between the action and the outcome. So it allows us to say that the action happened in order to bring about this outcome and not any other. Very simple idea, I hope, right? It's not supposed to be difficult at this stage. Now, here's the thing about intentions. They are linked to beliefs and desires. So if you have a look at some philosophical article on intention, for example, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you're going to see that philosophers say all kinds of different things about intention and they disagree, and there really doesn't seem to be any end to that. But for our purposes, we only need something which is a point that is agreed on very broadly. And this is that intentions characteristically are associated with, or perhaps even identical with, we don't care, beliefs and desires. So in this case, we might suppose I had a desire to fill Zach's glass and a belief that by pouring from the bottle, I would fill Zach's glass. And those two things are what led to, or if you like constituted, who knows, the intention that I pour in order to fill Zach's glass. Very simple, simplified picture here. Um, and this is all we need. This is all we need. Uh, this is the idea. The intention is related to the belief and the desire which specify that outcome and the means to achieve it. Very good. So now you can see when I ask that question, what's the relation between the instrumental action and the outcome or outcomes to which it's directed? It's even clearer when we put it in terms of this little piece of practical reasoning. Very good. But what's the problem then? So, so far I've said, look, there's a notion of instrumental action. There's a question about instrumental action, what relates the action to the outcome. Uh, and there's a very standard answer to that question. So what, what sort of complication might we encounter here? What could go wrong with such a simple story? Here's Tony Dickinson. Tony Dickinson says, instrumental behavior is controlled by two dissociable processes, a goal-directed process and an habitual process. All right, very good. Well, what's a goal-directed process? Dickinson puts it like this. He says, 
An action is goal-directed if it's mediated by the interaction of a representation of the causal relationship between the action and the outcome, and a representation of the current incentive value or utility of the outcome in a way that rationalizes the action as instrumental for attaining the goal. So that's Dickinson on goal-directed processes. Now, what I want to tell you here is you might want to spend some, some time with this quote because Dickinson is very important for us, but the way he set this up, that representation of the causal relationship between the action and the outcome, well, in our simple view, that's just the belief, right? The belief that pouring is a way of filling Zach's glass, a belief about the appropriate action, the pouring, that will result in a particular outcome, filling of the glass. Likewise, when Dickinson says representation of the current incentive value or utility of the outcome, in our terms, that's a, a desire, right? Desire to fill Zach's glass is in some sense a representation of filling the glass as having certain kind of value. So Dickinson is putting this stuff in fairly complicated terms because I think he wants more generality. He wants a view that doesn't tie you down to all kinds of things that philosophers might say about beliefs and desires. He wants to pick out their core features here. But fundamentally, he's offering us the same picture as the standard answer to our question about instrumental action, uh, just from the point of view of an animal learning theorist. Right? So the goal-directed uh, process is the process which involves belief, desire, and intention roughly speaking. Very good. So the next question is, well, what is that habitual process? What is that habitual process? And here we're into much less familiar territory. Here's the core idea. Uh, you have a stimulus. A stimulus is just another word for an event or a situation. Uh, so for example, you might have the presence of a glass. And then you have an action. So in this case, it might be pouring. And you have an outcome. Uh, a natural or possible state of the world. Uh, so we can imagine that uh, Zach's glass is filled is the outcome. Now that's not a natural outcome, but it's a possible outcome. And here's the thought. The outcome, that possible or actual state of the affair world, can be rewarding, right? Can be rewarding. And when we're talking about the habitual process, to the extent that the outcomes of the action are rewarding, so the connection between stimulus and action is strengthened. So here's the idea. You go around and you're presented with various empty glasses. There you are with your bottle. And as you fill those glasses, people give you, you know, pleasant smiles, which are one of the things that humans find rewarding. They thank you. Perhaps they even give you some money. And so you go around and you keep filling people's glasses. And what's happening over time on the habitual process is that that stimulus action link is getting stronger and stronger. It's getting reinforced so that in the future, when you're presented with this situation, you're holding a glass and there's an empty, sorry, you're holding a bottle and there's an empty glass, uh, you will be triggered to perform the action, the pouring action, right? The stimulus action link will trigger that. Very good. So here's the idea of the habitual process. When you've got a habitual process, the stimulus triggers the action directly, independently of any beliefs or desires that you might have. But the stimulus is linked to the action via a connection which is strengthened or weakened according to how rewarding the actions are. So let's look at this one more time. The idea in the case of the habitual process is that the action will occur in the presence of a stimulus. You're going to be rewarded or punished when that action occurs. And the stimulus action link will be strengthened when you are rewarded when somebody smiles at you or thanks you or gives you money or whatever else it might be. So if we ask whether the action is going to occur in the presence of the stimulus, the answer is just, look, it depends on the strength of the stimulus action link. Now contrast this with the case of goal-directed processes. So here the idea is that an action leads to a particular outcome. Your belief in the action outcome link is then strengthened. You've seen that the action occurs, you've seen that it's, the action is brought about, so now you've got an extra reason to think that that action will bring about the outcome. You also have, let's say, a desire for the outcome. It is desirable in some way to fill Zach's class or whatever it might be. So when we ask whether or not the action will occur, the answer is, well, it depends on two things. It depends on how, co how convinced you are that this is the action that will bring about that outcome, and also how much you desire the outcome. So what I want to draw your attention to here is that the distinction between the habitual process and the goal-directed process 
is a genuine one, right? It's not just two ways of describing one thing. There is genuinely distinct things here. How do we know that? Because of this. In the case of goal-directed processes, whether or not the action occurs depends on your current desire. If you suddenly stop desiring to fill Zach's glass, that action will stop occurring. By contrast, when your actions are controlled by a habitual process, that shouldn't happen. Right? It doesn't matter how desirable you find the outcome now. What matters is how desirable you found the outcome in the past. Uh, that's what made it rewarding or not for you and so strengthened the stimulus action link. The second thing is this. Where your actions are controlled by a goal-directed process, whether or not they occur also depends on what you think now about how likely that action is to bring about that outcome. If you suddenly think that pouring is no longer going to work, maybe you were sort of drinking a bit of the Prosecco yourself on the side there, and you realise that, gosh, you know, I'm too drunk, I can't pour. So your confidence in the connection between the action and the outcome uh, sh should and therefore diminish, right? Now you're a bit drunk. And so again, the action shouldn't happen. By contrast, when your behavior is under the control of habitual processes, that belief doesn't matter at all. That belief doesn't matter at all. What matters is that the action occurred as a consequence of the stimulus in the past, and was rewarded in the past. What you think now about the relation between the action and the outcome, totally irrelevant, should still occur. So what I'm telling you is this. The habitual process and the goal-directed process, those are genuinely different processes which uh, have sort of different ways of breaking down. There are different situations in which one or another will continue to cause an action after things have changed. Now let me go back to the question I asked. So I think this is the really fundamental question about instrumental action. What's the relation between an instrumental action and the outcome or outcomes to which it's directed. What I want to notice is that we can answer that question by appeal to habitual processes. If we think about habitual processes, we would say uh, roughly that the outcome is related to the action via their history, via their shared history. Let's go over that in a little bit more detail. Here's the thing. When you've got an action which was controlled by an instrumental action which was controlled by a habitual process, we know that the action was caused by a stimulus action link. We also know that for that stimulus action link to have caused the action, it must be a strong one. So there must be a situation in which the action caused an outcome in the past and that action was rewarding. Finally, we know that there's a reason why some of our actions, yours and mine, are controlled by habitual processes. And indeed, these habitual processes are uh, very widespread among all kinds of non-human agents as well. Habitual processes are good for us because they enable us to bring about outcomes which are rewarding. Right? The more of the rewardings the outcome in our environment are, we are able then to, uh, the, the more these uh, stimulus action links are strengthened. And so on the whole, when things go well, the more rewarding outcomes our actions will bring about. So habitual processes exist in order to enable us to bring about these outcomes. And it's in this way that the habitual process provides for that relation between the action and the outcome so that we can say the action occurs in order to bring the outcome about, right? The action is instrumental in virtue of those habitual processes. All right, very good. Um, but of course, as I noted, uh, noted earlier, we can also appeal to what Dickinson calls goal-directed processes to answer the question about the relation between the action and the outcome. Right? So if we think about goal-directed processes, the idea is that the outcome is related to an action via an intention or a belief-desire pair. It's the intention or other psychological states which underpin the relation between the action and the outcome, in virtue of which the action is instrumental. Let's try and do this in a little more detail again. So here's the idea. There is an intention and the intention specifies or represents an outcome. Also, the intention causes the actions and it does so in a way that would normally increase the probability of the outcome occurring uh, by providing for a coordination of those actions around the outcome. So you can see that when we appeal to this idea of a goal-directed process, we have a distinct second way of characterizing the relation between an instrumental action and the outcome or outcomes to which it's directed. What's my conclusion? Very simple. If we want to understand instrumental action, it's no good just to focus on the things that philosophers have mostly focused on, 
the goal-directed process involving belief, desire and intention, we also have to think about the habitual processes. Now so far that isn't terribly exciting. Our next step then will be to relate this very simple discovery from animal learning to philosophical theories of action and see if we can make some interesting trouble for them.